Hello Tank fans and welcome to episode 30 of the Totally Tank podcast. I'm going to tell you the date because it's really important for our discussion. It is the 5th of March 2022. We will be discussing events in Ukraine at the end of the podcast. But before that, hello Rob. Hi John, I'm Rob. <laughs> and we're talking about what tank today? The Samoa S35. Samoa. You think it's the Samoa? That's how everybody else pronounces hmm. videos I've seen. It's yeah. written uh, I mean, as, it's, stri- it's, as Strines. It's, we, a, it's we, an we, acronym, so you know. You yeah, as Strines, it as want. Strines, we pronounce it Samoa. Samoa. Yeah. That's uh, that's exactly how I thought as well. But everybody else seems to pronounce it Samoa. And uh, what does the acronym Samoa stand for? <laughs> right, now you tell it. Test, okay, it me. is the Societe d'Artillerie Mécanique Mécanique et Dussinage d'Artillerie. Samoa, yeah, mm. exactly. And uh, this, that, that's, this why, is, that's if, why it's called the Samoa, because that's the name they've given it, and uh, nobody could be bothered saying six words to get out. No, and also, I mean, it did literally have Samoa on a big base plate um, stamped on the front of the tank. Mm. Um, which and, have, and the rear. We'll have more stories about what happened with those base plates. Um, so it's a French tank. It was designed in 1934. Uh, it went into production in 1935. Uh, 440 were built. We're going to talk lots about it, so there's more to come. I would say the French never called it a tank or a char, which is what they call their tanks. What did they call it, Rob? It was a cavalry, uh, AMC cavalry vehicle. Mm, but what, what what does the, those AMC, oh, what do they stand I didn't, for? I didn't read No. Automat- <laughs> automatic <laughs> ma- ma- mechanized uh, char. No, I've got it um, in front of me. It is an automilitralise de combat. Um... Basically, it's a medium tank. Um, uh, yes. So, so that in their uh, cavalry units, they had uh, light vehicles, which were armoured cars. They had reconnaissance vehicles, which was the Hotchkiss H35. And then they had the Somwa uh, S35, F30, S35, yeah. which is the medium tank as now, the when I was researching combat this, part of the, of the um, uh, cavalry unit. When I was researching this, there was quite a lot of talk about the um, Somwa S40. It was never built, except as a prototype. uh, As a prototype, yes. Yeah. So it is irrelevant and unnecessary for discussion. When people say the Somwa, they mean the S35, which is the one we're talking about. Yes. uh, uh, So what happens with this tank is, well, brief history is the French built them, uh, the Germans invaded, the French lost, and then they stopped building them because the Germans weren't going to build any more of these things. But the Vichy French did say, can we build the S-40? And the, the Nazis said no. So that's well, the, the history of the S-40. The Germans basically said, what, you want us to divert resources that we could use to build useful tanks to build more of your stupid tanks? And the French said, that's what we're asking. And the Germans <laughs> said... No. <laughs> it, I mean, it's worth noting in the period of German occupation of France, um, France was absolutely starved of coal and um, oil and... Um, the, Mine, and steel. Yeah, but the, the, the whole country was basically thrown back into the Dark Ages. Mm. Um, there was no because, petrol, so basically yeah. it was all shipped off to Germany so they could fight the war effort. Yeah. But look, um, the S35, it's... What's, was it a good tank, John? It was the best tank in the world. It was. In 1940, it was a very good tank. Well, by 1940, I, I would argue... Sorry, not yet. Yep. And um, the, uh, you know, I think the record shows uh, that from its time when it was designed, or it went into service in 1936, when it was, I will argue, was the best tank in the world in 1936, mm. and remained so... Um, yeah. Thirty-nine until till the war started. Yeah, uh, but that was a period of of intense innovation. Where and going to war in a nineteen thirty-six tank would have been pretty hair-raising in nineteen forty. Yeah. So as one uh, source on the interwebs made made the point, it was the best of the interwar interwar period tanks, but it didn't survive the early war, Uh, which is I think is actually really really accurate. So it's a it was a cavalry tank, so it had a, a little burst of speed. It could go up to... <laughs> what do you mean? It had a little burst of speed for a cavalry uh, tank. It was fast enough. Yeah, I mean, it had a maximum speed 40. in theory of 41 kilometres an hour. Or on road. 25.3. Yeah. On road. Well, mostly we talk the on road speed. Yeah. Most people I've spoken to or, or seen talking about it suggest that this was 
we talk about the speed down a coal mine. Um, and uh, <laughs> it, it was chronically underpowered for a... Um, 190 horsepower. So, yeah. yes, for a 19 and a half ton tank. Yeah. Uh, so, in comparison with the Panzer threes and fours that it was mm. just running into, uh, were of the same... Uh, weight class, but uh, nine point seven uh, horsepower per ton, yeah. which I have literally driven lawnmowers um, with a better <laughs> power to weight ratio. Um, you know, it's it's but it was well, well like, armored, great for nineteen thirty six. As we'll, we'll keep having to say, people mm. are going to get bored of us saying that. There's a lot of things though that illustrate the deeper problems that France was facing going into World War Two. Particularly when they started the design process, they thought about using Christie suspension, which is um, the American J. Walter Christie suspension that was used in the T-34. Uh, but then they realized that the French industrial base couldn't um, manufacture the parts they needed for Christie suspension. So they went with a leaf spring suspension. And when your manufacturing base is coming back and saying, oh, that stuff that everyone else is building, we're not good enough to make that. That's a worry <laughs> when you're going into an industrial war. Yeah. Um, but if you can churn out enough of them, you'll be fine. But they yeah. only built 440. Shall, um, we, shall we keep talking about the problems? Or no, no, we no, we some of the we, we, no, 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 we can talk about some of the stats. So, okay. okay. So it had uh, a decent amount of armour for a medium tank. With, uh, Around 40 millimetres. Well, yeah, over, over 40 millimetres yeah. everywhere. All right. Mm. So remember, and remember the Panzers at this stage were only going around with 20 to 30 millimetres of armour. So yeah. heavily armoured mm-hmm. uh, in comparison to the tanks that they were going to mm. be up against. So the, uh, the Panzer, mainly ones and twos, but which couldn't get anywhere near it. Then came the three. Panzer threes and fours. The Panzer four could theoretically get through the armor, but they were, had the short barrel seventy uh, fives at this stage. Yeah, on, on its base stance, mm. it was in fact even comparable with an early production run Panzer four. Later, oh, later model production run yeah. Panzer fours are pretty much a different tank. Oh, but, yeah, totally, um, totally different tank. But it was yeah. the, the basis of what they. So it had a forty seven mil, mil, mil gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was big and a uh, decent uh, anti-tank gun at the time. Oh, Did, 47 millimeters is a, is a really good anti-tank gun in 1940. But they didn't... Uh, it was underpowered, so mm. it didn't have a... Uh, it wasn't enough uh, big enough caliber to fire a big enough round, so it was only, um, I think, a three-pound round or something like that. Well, or not considering even the British were using the two-pounder but they were into high, 1942. Yeah, they were high velocity. It was a high velocity for yeah. that two-pounder, yeah. Whereas uh, the French weren't didn't have that. So it could only penetrate up to 40 mils, but guess mm-hmm. what? That was enough for German tanks. Yeah. Um, did have HE rounds. But they didn't really stock them. Could carry up to 118 rounds in the tank. So these are quite small rounds, and so you can carry a lot of them. So um, um, It's quite hopeful. Yeah, that is really hopeful. But look, with the armour they had, they could actually fire them all off. Can we mention the other part of the deeper malaise of the French military that this tank really showed off? Go for it. They didn't train the operators how to fill it up properly. Yes. It had two fuel tanks. No one was trained to fill the second tank. So they would top it up. The first tank would uh, it was be four, full. 40 litres or 40 gallons or yeah, something like that. The and the other tank was about 100 litres. So yeah. And then they'd head off down the road saying, we've got enough for our operational range we of, filled it uh, up. Yeah, of 130 kilometres. And, uh, sorry, 230 kilometres on road. Uh, and then they'd um, run out of petrol 40 kilometres down the road because they'd only filled up the secondary tank. The primary tank, and then there's then you from the, once you fill up the primary tank, yeah. you then have to shift that. Anyway, they'd only filled up one of the tanks. They kept running out of petrol in a combat environment because yep. their crews. I can't begin to imagine not rectifying this training deficiency on the training ground, particularly for a tank that's been in service for four years. When when I talk about the soldiers five, this is a terminology we use in the Australian military of you can get somebody to read documentation as many times as you like, but if you actually Take them through. Take somebody who knows how to do the job. Take that person for five minutes and say, "This is how you do the job." That's called a soldier's five, right? Mm. And you just take them through and actually show them you do this and then this and then this and this. Yeah. And um, it's really effective. With any now, training got, for how to use any equipment, that yeah. sort of thing is really important. But, uh, but the, a lot of places just say, "Read, read the furnished material." Yeah, right? and they don't. Or they, they don't, don't understand it. When they they do. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. But if you take that soldier's five, you take them through and walk them through it. But obviously, the French didn't do that. They didn't even go to that effort. Yeah, I, and I seriously just question how, in the um, four years from an entering service to um, actually being used in World War Two, they didn't notice in their training exercises that they were having a problem with their um, the, the crew training. You know, uh, it's they probably weren't doing wrong it, load 
yeah. long road marches. It indicates that their training was extremely deficient mm. uh, in that period. And then you get the problems of trying to um, use mass mobilisation of um, people who might have had um, six months training a couple of years ago. Um, and you throw them at a vehicle, um, and it comes down to, you know, we talked about this with the Swedes um, claiming that they'd put um, national servicemen into um, their S tanks, um, and the, the Swedes who've been in touch with us still claim that that's what they do, and it's nuts. You know, if you're going to operate a specialised piece of machinery like this, you need more training than just mm. being called up and um, shown, here's the vehicle, go drive it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, yes. look at, <clears throat> so it also had a 75 mil coax gun, um, Crew of three. Now, John, in a crew of three in a medium tank, what mm. would you what would you like to have in a crew of three? I would like to have a commander and a gunner, um, and if it's a crew of three, I'm assuming there's some sort of autoloader and a driver. There you go. What do you think the um, the Samoa had? So I've got it right here in front of me. It had a um, a driver and a fellow called a radio operator purveyor, which I think means the person who actually went and found the food. Um, and a commander slash gunner, which, as we know, asking the commander to be the gunner is a now, bad idea. What, what, what sort of radios did the uh, radio operator have? They had no radios, so the radio operator was just there to go find food. So the radio, op- so the layout of the tank, it's a one or one and a half person turret. So the commander is the only one standing up in the turret. Their job is to traverse the turret, load the gun, aim the gun, and fire the gun. The radio operator is sitting down beside the driver. Doing nothing. Doing nothing because they have no radio. Because mm. while it was fitted for uh, radios, of the 400 built, only 100 or so had radio. No, or I, think, 80, I think it was 80, sorry, had radio. I think radio. this is the point we get to one of the other very distinctive features <laughs> of this tank. There was no hatch in the top of the turret. Mm. Which meant that the commander couldn't stick his head out. He did have uh, the weird little cupola that he had some periscopes in to look around in, but he couldn't actually pop the lid. So it's not like getting up out of the tank and waving signal flags around, which was being used by other countries in that interwar period. Yes. That wasn't even an option for this tank. Maybe he had blinkers? I don't know. Uh... Yeah, so <laughs> it had no capacity to communicate with other but vehicles. It, but it, if you, they'd had the radios, they, whereas the uh, the Nazis at this stage had um, uh, installed at least receiver radios in all their tanks, and the, com- yeah. the platoon commanders would have a receiver transmitter so they could yeah. issue orders. Which where... makes some sort of sense. The platoon commanders, I, I, I can see the logic. It turns out you actually need everyone to be able to receive and transmit. Yeah. But at least if the platoon commander can hear what, um, you know, battalion headquarters is asking for and um, tell his um, you know, the rest of his platoon, which is what, three other tanks, um, that that's useful. That, yes. that, that's a valid concept of operations. But the French only may have had one radio in their platoon commander's tank. So And, and what's he going to do? He get, he decides he needs to um, he do can't... something. How, is he going to let the other tanks yeah, in his platoon? So no. <laughs> it was a deficiency in French industry that they didn't have enough radios, whereas Hitler had invested in radios because he wanted to do everybody to hear his um, propaganda, which also, is why which is why Germany had a radio-producing industry. Yeah, but a phrase also that I am loath to say, but to be fair to Hitler... <laughs> He had been a communications runner. Yeah, true. He's a signal signalman. Yeah, uh, in the First World War. Um, so more than most, he probably actually had some sense of the importance of communication on the battlefield. Mm. Um, but right. Hitler, extremely bad. Not saying good. Just want to be very clear because we <laughs> had some criticism this week. But, <laughs> but you liked his moustache, did you, John? No, I did not like his <laughs> moustache. I, I, um, it's one of those things, uh, you know, people... There's a lot... Things Hitler did are appalling and extremely bad, and I'm not trying to justify it at all. People who say he's a coward, it's like, probably he wasn't. He was probably personally quite brave. He was just a terrible human being in every yeah. other way. Um, yes. Anyway, let's keep going. We'll move on. Don't mention the war. I think we're going to wait. doing a tank podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a point. All right. So, so we've got to another one of the huge failings of and this, this tank. Is the, is the main failing of the tank is that you have... The commander doing everything in there. Yeah, while a dude just sits there staring at him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, I mean, it was so bad that the Germans, when they finally captured, um, you know, took over France, said, wow, this tank 
is quite well built and quite useful and wanted to use it. And they said, but that Coppola has got to go. Yeah. <laughs> the Coppola, as John said, only had periscopes in it. There was no hatch there. The commander couldn't stick his head out. So the, the Nazis, when they took it over, they uh, uh, removed the French Coppola, put on a hatch. You couldn't climb in and out of the hatch effectively, but you could, if you were the commander, you could at least stick your head out and look around. Hmm. So it was a nice a- yeah. sniper aiming spot, but that's probably about it. Now that brings us to how did people get in and out of this tank room? Ah, there were two hatches, one on the rear of the turret for the mm. commander to slide in and out of. That yep. was also provided his only useful seat. Mm. So if he, he would, uh, you'd see them driving around through parades and so forth um, with the commander sitting out the back of his turret. And that mm. was, he could actually see anything that way. But you then have a great big hole in the rear of your turret mm. that uh, anybody could do anything Assuming into. Assuming the commander wants to sit down in amongst all the other And then there was a hatch in the side for the, the two... In the side. In the side. For the, the two... The side of the tank had a hole in it. Yes. It did have a very heavy hatch cover. Yeah. And I would say the hinge design they came up with to allow an extremely heavy, very large hatch to swing out without catching. Mm. Oh, well, you know, brilliant engineering solution to the problem, but... Just not a problem that you actually want to yeah, create in the because, first place. Yeah, hatches on sides, for those who don't realise, hatches on sides of tanks, that's where rounds are going to hit. Whereas a hatcher on the uh, flat surface of the roof of the tank is a lot harder for any sort of incoming rounds to hit unless it's being shot from above, mm. which doesn't happen unless you really stuff up. Yeah, it's it's certainly less common, whereas mm. the side um, is going to take... And what, everyone gets locked in the tank if... Um, if you roll the, on your side? Well, yeah. more to the point, if, I was just thinking in terms of if, if the hinges get damaged... Mm. Um, um, in the firefight that you built the thing to do, which is with a dirty great hatch in the side. Mm. Oh, it did have a escape hatch out of the bottom. Oh, okay. Crash. And, and it was, and it was Maybe the purveyor can use that to go and get help. <laughs> <laughs> and it was of a decent size that people actually could fit through it rather right. than some of the other escape hatches okay. that were only built for uh, very skinny uh, people unlike us. Mm. Yeah. Not that we would be selected to be tank crews these days. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> have you seen the videos about... Yeah, we'll get on to that. <laughs> yes, Ukraine's coming. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. <clears throat> what else do we want to say? Okay, cast the armour. Yep. So it was it was cast armour, so yep. a very good, effective uh, armour at the time, and mm-hmm. cast in four pieces. So it was very expensive to build and very cumbersome to build. However, the actual way they put the four pieces of armor, so it had a top, uh, had two two parts on the top, two parts on the bottom of the hull. Um, I had they, the model and, kits, and they bolted them together, yeah. and it was a very effective way of uh, putting the tanks together and, and making sure there was no rivets, flat planes. They could have some nice shaped, uh, oh, it had round, be- round, rounded lines, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, but that being said. It was expensive, and any time you wanted to do maintenance, you had to unbolt it and then lift off these huge yeah. pieces of cast iron. It's um, one of the things that when you start studying these things a little more deeply than an entirely superficial view, is you realise that the provision of access hatches to service machinery is one of the single most important parts of a design you, of Your tank things. is going to see a lot more maintenance than it is combat, usually. Yeah. <laughs> you hope, unless yeah. it's a T-34. And, and I think it's- T-34 is the exception that breaks that <laughs> But yeah, if what if you want to your tank to make it into combat, you have to do maintenance, uh, and that was really a, an issue with the tank. As they it even had armoured uh, skirts for the tracks, <clears throat> which, which I mean, the Matilda had armoured skirts as well with a, quite a similar concept of operations. Um, having said that, the Matilda skirts were widely but loathed. Matilda by their was crews. a infantry tank. This is a cavalry. Tank. There is a very good point as well. I think also the fact the leaf spring suspension was uh, they were more worried about it taking enemy fire. Um, yep, but it was but still again really hard big, to maintain. A big job. I mean, I don't think a three man crew could lift one of these um, skirt panels um, from looking at them. Um, you'd need I'd, to be in a workshop with a crane. I oh, think, there's but, probably there's probably a hook that you could uh, put a winch over or something on the tank, so you'd actually yeah, winch, winch it up. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's no with no small matter to, to be removing track, these things. Changing to, tracks on this thing would not be fun. Yeah. Um, it would be a lot of work and a lot of time is yeah. the big thing. Um, it so it had the cast hull uh, of good of good. Sorry, iron. I just wanted to say I hope the model makers and we have quite a few model makers in our listenership. Uh, like, if, I hope Tamiya, when they make the models, have the pieces equating to where the cast iron pieces came from, because that would be cool. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, because this was basically built like a, a model kit. Yeah. Mm. Um, it does have a lot of uh, similarities in looks to a Sherman. If you've, if you've looked at the two of them side by side, 
Yeah, I can the, see sh- that. the shape. I mean, besides the, t- the size of the turret and mm. uh, and the gun and the gun, yeah, it uh, the actual and that's basically there is a lot of similarities there. It's got, a, bo- the, it's got a boxy front at a um, like a six degree angle, and then the whole tank slopes down mm-hmm. at a thirty degree angle. Yeah. So it's not. I mean, it wasn't a bad design. It's just the big thing is the turret. And well, now, hang yeah. on, hang on, hang on. Parts of the design yeah. were good, mm-hmm. and parts of the design were poor. Yeah. So it. it like there was definitely poor design in here, but there was good things. And again, it comes back to in 1936, very good. Um, by 1940, um, mm. utterly surpassed, and, and particularly the lessons of the Spanish Civil War. Yeah, which I, obviously the French didn't look at, where the Germans had. Yeah, they really should have. Yeah. Um, and look- I wonder what the Germans are going to do. <laughs> if only there was some way to look at German tactics and uh, military vehicles in operation. As, as to what they've been doing for the last uh, nine months as well, as, mm. uh, between which is what? where the Germans have been learning. Poland, Czechoslovakia. Yeah, there was there was some opportunity to make some learnings. Netherlands. Yeah. Uh. Or was it Denmark? Sorry. One no, Denmark. Denmark. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, look, and. The turret ring itself, because the turret ring itself had, there was no capabilities. Even if they France had stayed in the war and could uh, uh, keep building, put better guns on these things, the turret ring meant that you were still stuck with a one one and a half person turret, and so you couldn't put a bigger gun on it. You couldn't. There was no upgradeability from it, and that was if France had stayed in the war, built, they would have needed from, a very different tank. Yeah, but why build a uh, spend a lot of time and effort building a different tank when you could upgrade your existing ones. But yeah, well, in this is, case, no. <laughs> yeah, in this case, you couldn't. There was yeah. no... Whereas Panzer IVs, yep, they had a decent-sized turret ring and you know what? They just whacked on whatever they felt like on top of that. Look, we will one day quite soon, I suspect, do an episode on the Panzer IV. But it, it is worth but noting... We're just teasing you with it right It now. is worth noting that the Panzer IV was used for things it was never designed for. Uh, and became a main battle tank despite originally being designed as a support vehicle and by the final versions was so overloaded as to be um, a, in a weird way upgraded into being a poor tank. So, yeah, I mean, Panzer IV is, is almost unique in its evolution um, in, in tanks, whereas this tank had no evolution because it was a dead end. Now, I think we've covered most of the stats for the tank, John. Mm-hmm. So let's go into, it's the probably it's, Claim to fame was the Battle of Hanut. Yes. If, I, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it at all, but in Strine, yeah, that's, how, that's how we pronounce let's it. Let's call it the Battle of Hanut. Let's take a little break and maybe open um, our special beer so we have some time to appreciate it. Yes. Yes, and we will be back to, to explain to you about the um, the Battle of Hanut, the biggest tank battle of 1940, and still one of the biggest tank battles of all time. Well, it was the first big tank battle. Mm. It was the first. Yeah. Alright, this is... Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, let's just say that. Yeah, cool. Okay, Rob, so tell us about the Battle of Hanut. Battle of Hanut, uh, from the 12th to the 14th of May 1940. Um, the Nazis had a cunning plan to trick the the Allies, the Frenchies and the Poms into uh, sending all their forces into Belgium, uh, holding them there, and then sweeping around behind them. Sickle cut. Sickle cut. It was more matadors, horns, and swords. Mm. And I think they called it. Um, Manstein called it the sickle cut. Mm, something like that. Um, yeah. But um, he used it a lot. Yeah. People kept falling for it. In fact, <laughs> I actually honestly thought we'll get to Ukraine, but I honestly thought at the start of it that that's what the Russians were trying to do was to draw out the um, Ukrainian defenders so they could um, deliver a sickle cut. Um, but it turns out that the Russians were just being silly. Anyway, anyway um, so the uh, Panzer. Third and fourth Panzer division. Sorry, the Nazis' Panzer. Third and fourth Panzer divisions have gone in th- to Belgium, uh, and now because Belgium was neutral at uh, the start of the war in 1940, um, they wouldn't allow the British or the French to come in and build defences against tanks and uh, invading Germans. So they said, "Oh no, we've built this stuff." And of course, when they got in there, the um, British and the French said, oh, they're not really good enough and the Germans rolled straight over the top of them. Now, not saying that the Belgian troops uh, fought, uh, did it poorly, it's just that it was a very difficult situation and they were trying to do it by themselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, and there was some ferocious defence yeah. by um, parts of the Belgian army, but in these, they were just enormously overmatched, which yeah. is a theme we will be coming back to. Yeah. However, um, 
about uh, 80Ks from Brussels is Hunut, and as the Panzers were rolling through the area, the, we had our first big tank battle of World War II. Now, I, I just want to note here that if, like Rob and I, we sort of grew up with um, the, I will still stand by it, fantastic documentary, The World at War, um, narrated by Laurence Olivier. One of the big lessons it t- told us was that the French never concentrated their tanks and the Germans did, and that's why the Germans did so well. And it's one of those things, there is some truth to their doctrine and operations. There's also some truth, the Germans didn't actually plan to concentrate their tanks. It was more uh, something that evolved in the course of the Battle of France, the way the Panzer divisions were given free reign as long as they stayed away from the rest of the infantry. Um, so there's a, a few factors there. But at the Battle of Hanover, the French concentrated an enormous number of tanks. Um, yeah. So 600 armoured fighting vehicles um, against you know, 618 German tanks. So um, so you had the 3rd uh, and 4th Panzer Division versus the 2nd and 3rd French DLMs, which is mm-hmm. their mechanised light, light divisions. Mm-hmm. We had about 25,000 Nazis versus 2,000 uh, Frenchies. Uh, sorry, 20,000 Frenchies. And as John said, um, about 600 to 600 tanks, well, armoured fighting vehicles on both sides. Uh, yeah, there were some Hotchkiss scout vehicles yeah. and some armoured cars. But mostly, and uh, the, 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 on the German side, there was mostly Panzer 1s and 2s and with only 125 Panzer 3s and 4s. Mm. Uh, uh, facing off about um, 160, no, uh, about 260 um, uh, sommoirs. So, from that, uh, they went into the battle and... As I said, the the Nazi plan was to try and draw the best British and French forces into the area and just hold them there. Um, so that was their whole uh, whole um, plan. Uh, when the battles actually happened, um, the Nazis found, oh, oh my God, we can't actually uh, penetrate these tanks, and they couldn't do anything against them. Mm. Um, and particularly a Panzer One, which is really barely a tank by modern. Yeah, it's got a stands. machine gun, on, I mean, yeah. cannon. So yeah. Barely an auto cannon, more like a machine gun. Yeah, but yeah. Um, you know the, these. In some ways, as a defensive battle by the French, although, I mean, the Germans kind of played them in that they were like, "Oh, we have to attack the Germans." Um, I still, you know, the size of the force they had here, the Germans did very well too. Um, Especially as they were attacking. Um, yeah. Uh, usually, your attacking force you want to be over uh, overwhelming, have overwhelming numbers against mm-hmm. your uh, defending force. Now the French had. Um, they were following their doctrine, however, they were following it badly because they were saying we need to hold these areas, but they didn't have the numbers to hold the mm. certain areas that they were trying to do. They also didn't maintain any sort of reserves or their lines were too thin, and so that if there was a, um, a breakthrough by the Germans, they couldn't uh, send the reserves there, or if there was a chance of exploitation by their own forces, they had nothing they could send in, in at the time. Mm. But Now, sorry, something I want to digress on briefly, but it is relevant, I promise. Um, is that um, one of the things that happened in the um, Millennium Games exercises was that the US Marine Corps General Van Riper used motorcycle couriers, and this is, was his genius, that they couldn't be intercepted, um, and then he sank the US Navy, and then they reset the exercises, and then he quit because they reset the exercises. Um, anyway, lots of people talk about, oh, genius, use your motorcycle couriers. The French in the Battle of France said, ha ha, we don't want the Germans intercepting our radio communications, we will only use motorcycle couriers, and that was a significant part of why they were always a day late and a dollar short um, in every engagement, because uh, they just weren't communicating fast enough to deal with the Germans um, coming through. There you go. Mm. Don't trust motorcycle couriers. <laughs> well, you know, literally, they, you know, the motorcycles break down, particularly in 1940s era motorcycles, or they get shot or strafed or something happens, and then, you know, they're clutching a little message that's really important saying, you know, uh, general, uh, defend this position, and no one ever gets the message. All right. Stupid. <laughs> Stupid French. All right. So, while this is all happening, the, um, the Nazis are sending their other forces through the Ardennes. Uh, in behind the French and British forces in Belgium. Uh, but the Battle of Hanut, it was a... Um, of the first encounters of Allied tanks versus German tanks, this was a best end scenario for the Allies. So when the T-34, when the Russians tanks first met uh, the Panzers, they lost. When the British first met the Panzers, they lost. When the Americans first lost, met the Panzers, they lost. The French uh, held their own, 
did retreat from the battlefield, but that was part of their battle plan, is that they were only trying to buy time so that the infantry could dig in better defences than the uh, behind them so that they could stop the German advance through Belgium. I mean, the French achieved most of their objectives in this battle. Mm. The problem was they had dumb objectives. Yes. But, and the Germans were thinking in a larger, more dimensional space, and the French going, ha-ha, we have heroically defended, um, were... Um, that's a terrible French accent. Anyway. <laughs> uh, oh, my were, were setting themselves up for um, larger failure because they weren't thinking in terms of the bigger strategic space. The irony being that when the Germans got onto the Russian steppes, it was the Russians that were actually planning um, on levels that the Germans weren't um, mm. contemplating. But yeah. it just 30, goes to 30 show kilometres you... worth of depth of mm. uh, uh, tank defences, yeah. <laughs> you, but it just goes to show you've got to, um, a bit like you know the Chinese game Go, um, it, it's all about where the outer shell of the game is happening and uh, if the other side can increase the dimensions of the, um, the battlefield in ways you haven't thought about, you're in a lot of trouble. Mm. Um, so the Germans lost 160 panzers of various types, but held the ground, and so they were able to uh, recover most of those. Uh, only 50 were totally destroyed, whereas the French lost 105 uh, tanks at Hunut. So quite a number, mostly, again, of the Hotchkiss and uh, lighter, lighter ver versions, but they didn't hold the ground because they were, their part of their plan was to keep retreating, to give ground in order to buy time, so they couldn't re uh, recover any of those tanks. So they overall, they probably lost... Um, as plans go, we will advance very quickly away from our defences and then retreat slowly back towards our defences. does leave a little bit to be desired when you think of it that way. Yeah. I'm sure that wasn't quite how they thought about well, it. Well, it was time, just but... the politics of Belgium at the time that they couldn't do it. Uh, um, yeah. So, I mean, some of the writings from the Germans uh, after, after the battle was that the decisive cause for the German success, uh, success in battle against the French tanks was the fact that the French always fought against um, a regiment with only a small number of tanks, therefore it was possible to destroy them with concentrated fire. Our only, our only uh, relatively with our re only relatively few armor defeating weapons. It could it would lead to a very difficult situation if the French employed a large number of Somwa tanks against us. Mm -hmm. This is what they were saying. So. Now, again, this gets back to the communications effects of being able to... So they did deploy a large number of tanks, but they were all fighting as a small groups rather than yes. as, as, a, as a yeah. regiment or, mm -hmm. or, 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 uh, or larger. But even if they had concentrated them, their, the communications problems would have bitten them because when we talk about communications, we're literally in this case saying the German platoon saying everyone aim your gun at that tank there. Mm. Um, and then, you know, in any um, armoured vehicle situation, be it on land and at sea, the objective is to um, point all your guns at the same thing till it's destroyed and then keep doing it. Um, yep. And even, uh, and they couldn't, but the thing is they couldn't with uh, a number of them until they got around to the sides, which mm. another aspect was the, because the commander was the gunner and the loader and everything else, mm -hmm. um, the, Poor the, situational awareness. The, the French tanks would stop. Mm. Basically, they'd manoeuvre into position and then they'd stop because the guy who's telling you to go uh, to where to go to do the next bit of job is already doing loading, aiming, firing, and trying to communicate with any uh, with his driver about what he's doing. So mm. they stopped and it was mm. they became, became armoured pillboxes waiting for mm. uh, until something else happened. But until the Germans break, would... break in the fire to be able to. Whereas the Germans had. Uh, crew of five, and they can just manoeuvre around because they all had uh, a job to do. But also with radios, you can say something like, you know, platoon, um, you know, d deploy to the west um, and um, shoot the side of that thing. Yeah. Um, whereas the French are having to guess and hope that their um, platoon members are thinking the correct tactical thought in that moment. Um, and that's a hell of a, oh, God, no. um, a hope to take onto the battlefield. Uh, yeah. So Battle of Hanut. Um, I, I would also note it's not tank related, but um, the air losses of the um, Allies were astonishing. In the um, the RAAF sent thirty eight bombers and lost twenty two, um, which is um, incredibly poor. And the French Army Lair um, de Lair um, sent eighteen of their um, Brejute, uh bombers um, and lost eight. Um, and that was another failing of the uh, French uh, forces in that they didn't actually support their tanks with 
uh, anti-aircraft uh, support. So while the there was combat air patrols over the areas for in support of the British and the French uh, mm-hmm. troops, a lot of that got diverted uh, to support other activities. And so suddenly the, the Germans had air superiority over the area. So the Stukas um, uh, did cause a lot of damage to yeah. I'm not sure that was present at Hunut as much but uh, in the following days as the uh, British and French started retreating they the Stukas were a main factor in um, taking out a number of these tanks because there was no no uh, nothing to stop the the, the air superiority of the, of the Germans so uh, interesting stat um, on the first day the 12th of May uh, the German fighter wing 27 had 85 Messerschmitt 109s, which at that stage of the war was an excellent uh, fighter plane. Uh, they flew 340 sorties that day with 85 planes yeah. um, to uh, you know, and, and just smashing up any sort of air cover the Allies were trying to uh, put in there. Um, and they they claimed 26 Allied uh, aircraft lost for four fighters, and then German anti-aircraft artillery claimed another 25. Mm. Um, so um, just a uh, an absolute meat grinder, um. and that's one of the things that the Germans did provide their troops with anti aircraft, and that was the um, the eighty eight, and mm. uh, it was used for anti tank roles in in Belgium and in northern France as well. Yeah. Um, and because they found that that was the only thing that was going to get through the armor of the Chabi and the yeah. and the somewhat as as good as the eighty eight was an anti tank role, I still will maintain that it would have been better to have anti tank guns doing their job as yes. a lower profile gun mount dedicated to the job, and your divisional anti air doing divisional air defense. Um, but uh, mm. yes, uh, anyway, certainly the eighty eight was um, extremely successful in this period. Look, and there was even a situation at the Battle of Arras, um, uh, where seventy British, oh, sorry, seventy sort French of broke through. Sorry. Oh yeah, uh, the French at Arras. Yeah. Yes, at um, mm. uh, the seventy French and seventy four British uh, mm. tanks uh, went on a counterattack against the German forces that were trying to uh, cross the river, and they started that by shooting at each other. So, and the British managed to take out four Samoas. Um, before the Germans uh, managed to uh, get draw them into and then took out the rest of them with 88. So that was mm-hmm. a bit of a blow to all, all involved there. Um, the Battle of uh, Murdop on the 13th of May, the second tank uh, battle of World War, uh, of the war, um, 24 of the 82 uh, Somoise, only sorry, only 24 of the 82 um, Somoise that went into battle that day survived again, taken out by Stukas and uh, and anti tank fire. So again, the German tanks were not inflicting these mm. damages. It was just a case of yep. So it, but after the fall of France, John, the tank yes. did, it didn't stop its value. It didn't stop uh, working because it then got repainted and uh, given a proper cupola. <laughs> yeah, a well. Uh, a better Coppola. A better Coppola. Yeah. And it was, uh, as the Nazis were called, they call them the, where is it, the... The Butte Panzer? Butte Panzers, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which means uh, booty or uh, spoils, mm. spoil tank. Oh. So it's what a booty they, Panzer. Yeah, a booty Panzer. Now, I'd like to see that in Girls yeah. and Panzer. <laughs> <laughs> Panzer Kampfwagen 73935-S uh, uh, brackets F. Mm. Um, they were used as so three hundred of the, of the Somwars were used by the Nazis. Some given to uh, the Hungarians, the Italians, and Romanians. Mm-hmm. Um, they were used in second line Panzer divisions, uh, so they weren't on the front lines, but they were an effective tank. Um, again, they fitted them with radios. Surprise, surprise! Um, and they carried out uh, activities. Uh, the Vichy French were even allowed to man a uh, squadron of uh, tanks, and they said, "Look, we'll go down to North Africa and fight uh, and um, fight in the in Algiers for in the Battle of North Africa." And once they got down there, uh, a little while later, and it did take them a little while, but um, they said, "Oh, you know what? We're going to uh, jump over to the other side." And this is where we get to the nameplates. So they take yes. they they taken their um, somwas and they'd gone to North Africa as part of the Vichy force to fight the Allies. Uh, and after a while, they said, we're going to switch sides at this point and join back in. And they've joined the Allies and they've um, taken their Somwise and they've been fighting uh, against the Nazis again. Uh, 
but at some point or another, basically, they ran out of parts, fuel, uh, ammo, and anything else that was designed for their tanks. And they said, right, uh, we want to keep fighting, but we can't do it in our tanks because we've got no parts. So the Allies gave them some Shermans, as Can you, you do. imagine being the commander of a Somma and then being given a Sherman? <laughs> it would be like all your Christmases had <laughs> come at once. It would be the greatest day <laughs> what do you mean of you your pick, life. What do you mean? What do you mean two other people doing in the turret with me? <laughs> What do you mean I don't have to... Just, I, I'm the loader and the gunner and the... you. But, I've got an intercom and, and I've got a radio. <laughs> we, I can talk to the other guys in the platoon. Uh, I've got an electric, electrically heated crew suit. Um, oh, it, you know, uh, it would have been a... And, and a 75mm gun and better armour and um, some horsepower. Uh, it, it really would have been a, um, a joyous day. It, well, not if you're uh, uh, an agrophobic, but a... Uh, didn't like people around you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you just enjoy the loneliness of every, everything resting on your shoulders. Um, yeah, it would have been a very but happy day. But they kept their Samoa nameplates. They did. They, yes. they prized them on. They prized them off their uh, Samoas and put them on the front of their Shermans to say, look, we are still cavalry, we are still French, and mm. these are still our tanks, uh, even mm. though because we can't get parts or ammo or anything else. From and also our, our tank's rubbish. Yeah, but yeah. by that stage, this is 1943. Yeah, but I will continue to clarify. It is a rubbish tank in 1940. It is an increasingly rubbish tank by 1943. It was an excellent tank in 1936. And I would even say that in 1940, its failings led to the defeat of the French armies that were using it in some significant ways. There were many other problems in French doctrine, training... Um, all sorts of things. Um, but it did have a V8 petrol engine, John. Uh, yeah. Which means you could actually one fill was, it up. One that was way too small for the tank. I know, but you could yeah. actually at least fill it up from uh, normal yeah, petrol As stations. opposed to the Char, which had to have a special... B. Char B. Yes. The Char B had to have a special fuel supply system so that while the Germans were filling up at French petrol stations, the um, French could not. Yeah. Uh, which would have been very insulting and aggravating. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> It's a very frustrating tank, and in some ways, on its paper numbers, it was still... I mean, for a cavalry tank, and it yeah, was meant to be a, a, a fast scouting tank, to mm. be um, almost invulnerable to enemy fire while um, smashing up the enemy, um, that's an accomplishment, and particularly from a 1936 design. So it was it was so far ahead of the rest in thirty six, but it had significant design limitations and failings, and the French failed to fix them. I would say when we talk about French doctrine... The Chieftain um, has got a long video, like an hour long, about French military uh, armoured doctrine leading into the Second World War, and he consistently makes the point that if you read the French doctrine and you were to read modern American armoured doctrine, it's very hard to spot in what ways they were wrong in terms of uh, modern American armoured doctrine uh, if you assume that that is a good doctrine. So the, the doctrine as written wasn't entirely wrong or it was at least defensible in the assumptions they were making and the conclusions they were drawing. It just didn't work in the field with what they were doing. And they did have some success with their hedgehog uh, uh, positioning formation mm. whereby it was a defensive formation that if they set up uh, with all-round defence with any sort of uh, um, organisation, so even when the Germans did bypass them, outflank them or whatever else mm. and surround them, they did have all-round defence and the French forces did fight quite effectively for quite a while in those formations. Mm. Um, now, it wasn't just the, um, the, the tanks, but it was also uh, just part of their doctrine of, yep, we're going to get through, if, if they make a breakthrough, we'll get surrounded, but we're going to have all-round defence and so we mm. can keep on fighting because we have secure flanks everywhere but it was in small formations and um, eventually they just ran out of uh, rounds and uh, and food and water and so forth yeah i mean we said this about the italian tank and i'll, I'll say it again here um you know i have of the italian men i have known they are not notable for their cowardice and certainly the french men i have known um have also not been notable for their cowardice and some of these assumptions we make about oh they run away or whatever uh taking certain events out of their context. Um, but, you know, and I would also say that the disaster in France in 1940 was as much, um, you know, the British um, certainly agreed with the plans um, that turned well, out the to British be... were saying, why, why don't you keep on fighting, keep on fighting? And it's the, it was the French uh, leadership that uh, gave up Paris and then said, oh, look, we'll just... Um, 
Uh, I think we're done now. Yeah. I, Whereas I, the people involved and the government, the government uh, was not uh, involved with that decision to um, surrender Paris or surre- uh, or um, uh, surrender uh, the capitulation of of, Fra- of France. Yeah, that was that was the military, did, the, the military it, leadership, I should say. Yeah, it did turn out that French doctrine and planning and equipment and um, the, the structure of their army. All of these things um, let them down and were wrong and weren't fit for purpose for fighting Germans in 1940. Um, but that is not a, um, a slight on the individual fighting qualities of the French soldier, which remains um, one of the finest bodies of soldier the world's ever known. Yes, um, they do a lot, of, do a little, a lot of work that uh, Western countries don't see because we only see certain media. Yeah. Um, they did work all through all the way through to 1946, where they were last used in Algiers mm-hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> by the French. Yeah, another um, another miserable disaster of French. But we won't talk planning. about it. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so uh, they were all retired after uh, last uh, in 1946. So that was so from 1936 to 1946, they were in use. Um, uh, there was nothing really of seen of note of them uh, in use by the Nazis. Um, they they had lots of uh, parades in them down the Champs Elysees by the looks of uh, all the footage. And I believe um, a um, Somewhere S thirty five was in the Bastille Day parade in twenty twenty. Uh, they've had, yes, they've got a, a Somwa and a Chabi that uh, they mm. bring out for the Bastille Day parades. I'm not quite sure why they do that, but um, if, if it makes them happy, that's yeah, they, not, not our business. Well, it's, 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 <laughs> I'm sure the cavalry, the, cavalry, uh, the horse wallopers, uh, yeah. like uh, like see them uh, running around. Yeah. <laughs> All right. At this point, we're going to take a little break and we're going to come back with a beer. very special beer review. Yeah. This ain't the Graga Rail. One pint down, you'll be swinging in the gale. Five pints, bully, you'll be shaking in your shoes. So now it's time for... Beer Review! Uh, and Rob, what have you got us? I've got us a Lindemann's Lambic Pesha's Artisanal Pecker... It's got a naked woman on it with boobies and hair. All right. Pesheress, I would call that. But, yep, there you uh, go. So this is from the <laughs> Lindemann's uh, Brewery, mm-hmm. uh, which is celebrating its 200th anniversary this year. It was, uh, started in 1822. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's um, 80 Ks from... It's in Belgium, and mm-hmm. it's 80 Ks from Hanut. So there I thought, go. right, that's why I thought we'd get this one. They were lucky not to get smashed. Um, mm-hmm. Although there has been a lot of rebuilding since. So, mm-hmm. And uh, Lambic generally... In Belgian brewing means it's a fruit beer, but it does actually refer to a specific sort of yeast they use. Um, If you are to visit a serious brewer who makes lambics, one thing you'll notice is that all of the equipment they use um, for lambic will be marked lambic in big red letters because you can't use it for anything else because the yeast is so um, hard to get rid of and produces quite peculiar flavours that aren't normally desirable in beer, and it's only because the Belgians are so clever with their beer making they can um, get good beer out of it. Yes, from the website they say it's a spontaneous fermentation and the oldest style beer is still brewed style. today. That's what the, uh, they've, the Lindemans have there's, written about their beer. There's a little word about spontaneous ferment that I'm going to talk about here, which is that breweries <laughs> say it's spontaneous ferment, which means they just leave it open and the wild yeast in the area um, inoculates the, um, the batch and then does its fermentation. And the reality of a brewery is that the air and everything around is the house culture of the brewery. It, it, that's the yeast that's there. It's not wild yeast. You have to you have to go out into the wilderness with yeast traps to actually catch wild yeast. Um, if you just hang around <laughs> your brewery, what you're getting is what you've been using. Um, uh, so it's like so hunting uh, wild yeast is like hunting wild doner kebabs, is it? <laughs> uh, no, but people do hunt wild yeast. Uh, I've, I've got a friend here in Canberra who um, puts uh, yeast traps out on Mount um, Ainsley. Um, so, heard of yeah. Wild and, yeast. And let me tell you, every single yeast he's ever caught has been bog standard beer yeast. Uh, because even just on the you know, fringes of a city, hundreds of metres from the nearest residence, um, the wild yeast that is around here is still just the yeast that's come out of the brewing process because we make so much of it and it's you know, just <laughs> everywhere. Um, <laughs> no, having said that, um, Bent Spoke Brewing here in Canberra 
has actually sent a yeast trap up to the edge of space in a um, hydro, uh, helium weather balloon uh, and did catch an unusual sort of yeast and it makes quite poor beer. <laughs> well, it doesn't turn, at least it doesn't turn anybody into zombies or yeah, uh, <laughs> poison, poison the atmosphere or anything yes. like that. Because uh, anyway. you don't actually, we don't actually know much about what's ha- happening up the uh, upper echelons of the atmosphere. No. It could be very dangerous for us to bring anything back. All right, anyway, I've drunk that beer and I'm still not a zombie, so there, there you, you go. go. All right, so it's only 2.5% alcohol and it's a small bottle. I can't even see where... What's... Maybe 250? I can't even tell. Yeah. The, word, the, the words are too small. Everything's um, too small for my poor old eyes these days. Uh, it says it's a 0.5, but I'm not sure a 0.5 what. Uh, 0.5 standard drinks. Okay. 0.5 standard drinks. For 25 the centilitres. Oh, okay. So it's 250. Yeah. Here's a 250 ml beer. And um, I would call this a dessert point. beer. It is. It was so fruity. Mm-hmm. So sweet and fruity. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's it, it's you. You're not saying it, this is the beer. This you're saying this is a dessert drink, um, or a, or a, um, fruity something or other. Oh. Yeah, and no, I'm pretty sure peaches means peaches. Uh, um, so I think it's a peach flavored um, beer, which accords with the flavors I'm tasting. And possibly the naked woman on the front, on the label. Yeah, although you, you can't see much of a bum. <laughs> um, she has got a sheet and. Um, she looks like she's drunk a lot of beer. She's got very rosy cheeks. Yep. Um, and breasts. Oh, yep. They're shaded red as well. Mm. Um, who knows Who knows what she's been up to in that <laughs> boudoir, um, drinking her peach lambics. Um, uh, anyway, Rob, well done on getting a beer that is not only from, um, well, not quite the correct country, but definitely... Um, it has it has meaning. It has a con- connection to the tank and yep. is extremely close to the battlefield the tank had its main engagement at. Mm. So, congratulations on that. And seriously, this is it is treatly. Yeah, it's definitely peaches. It's peaches on the nose. So if you smell it, you'll get a ton of peaches. It's peaches on the taste, and you know peaches are delicious. Mm. Um, I'm, not so, sure about, I'm not sure about a peach beer. Look, I reckon... It's, it's, it's not really a beer. I would serve this with dessert yeah. in the same way that I might serve a um, spotritis um, white wine mm. or a um, basically any sort of dessert wine. This this could substitute for, though. Yes. And if one was doing a, um, a beer degustation, then this would be a real hit to wheel out um, ah, food, food with the dessert is, course. There you go. Mm. No, good thinking. Uh, you can also get other Belgian lambics that are, you know, cherries is a big one they like doing, um, plums, um, strawberries. Um, anyway, all your traditional European fruits, uh, pretty much the Belgians have um, made a beer with at some point or another. Um, so but, $12 for a pack of four. But that's yeah. a good price for a beer like this. It is, um, but yeah. Ooh. And very fancy little bottles with lots of gold wrappings on them. Look, the, the reality is we're drinking our second bottle now, and one probably would have been enough. Mm, it's just, but they're very small bottles, so you yeah. don't really count. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, between two of them, we've got ourselves a, a pint. Um, <laughs> and, well, between two of them... Uh, a, a, a pint and, is a and, bit and, more than I actually wanted. <laughs> and a single standard drink mm. involved as well. Yeah, I, I, could re- I could very happily drink this in a, a very small glass um, with, a, uh, <laughs> with, a, with a small dessert, and, and that would have been fine. Um, it's not because there's anything wrong with it. It's just a very sweet, cloying, treacly... Um, Beer with not much booze, so we're actually kind of sobering up now, which is good. Because <laughs> now we, we've got we to talk about Ukraine. The sobering stuff. So a few things going on. I think one thing that might be useful to explain it is um, the Radio War Nerd podcast, which um, you have to pay to listen to, so not like us, that's free, uh, admitted that they were wrong because they'd said the war wasn't going to happen. But one of the things they'd talked about as to why the war wasn't going to happen was that no one was picking up the usual chatter in the Russian officer class you would expect when planning a major invasion. Because people have to go to conferences and uh, people have to request intelligence and a, a huge amount of communications has to happen to, to figure out, you know, where each... I mean, the Russians are moving in uh, basically battalion groupings. I think they call them BTGs. Um, and, um, you know, that's around a 1,000 men... Um, and there's lots of them. I think, what, 130,000 odd Russian troops have been committed so far? Yep. Um, and so there's all these, this, this, this talk should be happening for how do, where are we going? How do we get there? How do we get food there the day after we get there? 
and none of that planning was done, which certainly meant they achieved some element of surprise uh, because everyone who was looking at their chat was like, oh, they can't possibly be invading. But it does mean that having charged pell-mell in thinking the Ukrainians were just going to surrender, they've now got troops that haven't eaten in days and, and are begging Ukrainians and for don't food. Have, don't have a don't have a plan of what they're going to do next. Yeah. Now, my, my question to John before was, um, we did, we had noticed pre, noted previously that it was going to be happen after the end of the Winter Olympics because that's was going to happen. Um, the Chinese basically uh, told the Russians they'd give them diplomatic cover for it, but not if it happened during the Olympics. Yeah. Their Olympics. Uh, well, we assume that was mm. what the case was. But my thoughts were, if you're going to go in, um, and yes, they tried their thunder run down the, the highway to Kiev, uh, but... Oh, quickly, can we yeah. talk about why we should call it Kiev? Yes, please do. Mm. I um, always called it Kiev, but uh, I'm no. now starting to call it Kiev, because yes. that's what people are telling me. People are. Now, the reason for that, and this will hopefully be helpful to um, listeners, uh, is that Kiev is the Russian um, pronunciation, Oh yeah. and Kiev is the Ukrainian pronunciation. Mm-hmm. And if you were to say Kiev, you would be in some small and tiny way acknowledging the Russian claim of ownership. Um, you might not mean it that way, but it's something to think about. So it is better to call it Kiev as the Ukrainians prefer mm. at, at this moment. I did like uh, a photo put out um, uh, by, I think it was the US consulate in mm. Ukraine or something, saying, here's a photo of Ukraine in 996, and uh, sorry, in, of Kiev in 996 BC, mm. uh, AD. Oh, it was the capital of uh, Russia? Yeah, mm. well, no, it was the capital of, of that area. Of Rus, and yeah. and, and, um, and Not a photo, a, I would imagine, but a drawing. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, no, no of, of the buildings that were there. Oh, there. right, okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah. photo mm. of the buildings that were present in, that, in the world mm. in 996 uh, AD mm. yeah. and of Moscow. Moscow mm. was a forest. Yeah. Kiev had lots of great big buildings and mm. uh, churches and everything else, and it was yeah. a well-established uh, large city. Mm. Whereas Russia was oh, sorry, Moscow was not. Yeah, it was. And, and it was. It's a, is a much more recent addition. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I thought that was uh, anyway worthwhile. Now I was talking, um, chatting with John about it before of why are the are all these convoys just lining up on roads and saying, oh "My God, are they, if." Five minutes, buddy, air parody, and the um, the Ukrainians just bomb the hell out of this. But unfortunately, mm. they don't have that. Or literally one flight of Apaches. Yeah, mm. but um, that's a moment for another discussion. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but the point being is that uh, why are they just lining up on the roads? And John's pointing out, well, it is mud season of in Ukraine now, and so it goes where, for about six weeks. Yeah. So where I thought, if why are you following roads? Why aren't they just traipsing straight across from the Belarusian? Uh, border down to Kiev and being done with it uh, rather than being stuck on all these roads. And well, the reason is, yeah, and I've now been seeing the photos of the tanks drowned in mud and left abandoned by their troops because that's what happens uh, in if you can't get through, if you're not rated to go through certain uh, certain terrain and mm. mud is not a great thing for tanks. Now, one thing that this that war has resolved is that many people in America thought that. Russian disinformation was so sophisticated that it had turned the 2016 election in Donald Trump's favour. And I think we can safely say, having seen the complete disintegration of Russian disinformation, um, and they are being, had rings run around them by the Ukrainians, that it is unlikely that Russian disinformation is as sophisticated as some people had thought it was. I disagree on that, on that the, the exploitation of uh, what they did in 2016 was probably more based around the exploitation of um, capitalism uh, uh, but being able to throw money at capitalists in yeah. order to get them to do what you like uh, is a great way of subverting uh, any rules and um, uh, morales. Sure, but in terms of, you know, the Russians are everywhere on the internet and they're masters of, of uh, memes, you know. Oh, okay. at, uh, no, no, I don't think that yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not that good at it. Um, they're doing a terrible job. Um, I did like um, the uh, Ukrainian tax office announced this week. I love that. That um, any anyone... Boot, any booty tanks? Yeah, anyone capturing um, Russian tanks doesn't have to declare them as income <laughs> um, and uh, yeah for folks I imagine most of our listeners have been watching quite closely what's going on but uh, there has been numerous videos of um, 
Ukrainian farmers just pulling their tractors up to abandoned Russian machinery and towing it away. <laughs> oh, no, and not even that. Is uh, there are now? I, I looked it up myself on uh, videos on how to start a Russian tank. Oh, the TikTok videos. Yep. The, the, the the beautiful young uh, yep. Ukrainian TikTokers of uh, this is how you start a BNB. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, press this button, this button, this button. You flick flip, all flip, four flip, of these dip switches. Yeah, and, away, and then off you're driving. I was thinking, that's yep because. I would like to know if she had done military service to know how to do that or if she just had someone advising her on how to do it because she seemed to know what she was doing. Don't know. Don't mm. know. But um, it's one of those things that, uh, yeah, if you find a, an abandoned Russian tank in a field and um, uh, you jump, you can jump in, look at, look up on um, YouTube or, yeah. or, or TikTok at mm. how to start it, away you go. And, uh, yeah, off, you've seen all that happening. Now, this is not too... We don't so, want to underplay the suffering of the Ukrainian people at this time. No, but we have a focus on things that we've looked at and uh, the tanks we're talking about. Uh, and the tanks with hats didn't work either, did they, John? They didn't, which is interesting because someone... They did make good luggage racks. Yeah, they made, made good luggage racks. I did have someone who claims to know a lot about Javelin missiles tick me off and say, no, no, you can't adjust the fusing on the Javelin, it's a contact fuse only. That may or may not be true, because I'd suggested that an adjustment of the fuse could help deal with the hats. Certainly, whatever they're hitting the Russian tanks with, they're going straight through the hats and obliterating the tanks. Mm. So, um, make of that what you will. It could have been they were using in-laws or something else. Um, and certainly, the data we have is extreme. It's not statistically valid. We're just seeing outlier cases. Yeah. There's a few really interesting things going on right now. One of them is that social media, and in particular, the Russians didn't do any of the normal groundwork for an invasion. So they no. didn't knock out the electricity. They didn't knock out the internet. Um, things that, you know, I mean, the Americans, um, when they invaded Iraq, had a six-week um, air campaign but prior to um, sending in ground troops to take care of all the mm. things. And that just hasn't happened here. So in particular, with Ukrainian civilians um, lining the streets with um, their phones, um, taking video of Russian convoys moving through, there's got to be um, a Ukrainian operations room where they're grabbing... Because every picture on a mobile phone has the time and the location mm. built into it yep. by default. Um, the ability to use this data being generated by the um, populace is uh, is huge for you know telling um, attack team sixteen to uh, move to a particular road and wait twenty minutes. And I've got to say, the information what I'm seeing uh, through the news and uh, other places here of the Ukrainian forces, you're not seeing a whole lot of their forces being deployed. So that's good. That's good from their point of view of not seeing all that. Uh, you're seeing a lot. Oh, their opsec is way better than the Russians. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm getting at. Is that. Um, they're, you're not seeing them uh, lining the roads and um, uh, them getting filled and put on cameras and so forth. A little bit in the um, the comp fighting going on in the um, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk republics um, that you are seeing some video of um, Ukrainian vehicles um, there. Right. Um, but when it's fighting in Ukraine, no, that's um, we're only seeing the Russians. Um, yeah, and it's, it's it's interesting, but um, for the size of the Ukrainian military, and it's not small, it's bigger than the Australians. Well, it's a uh, country of 40 million people. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. It's much <laughs> With bigger. a very unpleasant neighbour. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're not seeing where the actual fighting is taking place, which I'm surprised, surprised about. Um, not seeing more coverage of that. It's just the build-up of Russian forces mm. and then uh, what's happening afterwards. Yeah, I want to just briefly touch on one thing that I... A couple of things the Ukrainians have done that I think are appalling... Um, one is they've announced that they're not going to treat Russian artillerymen as prisoners of war. That was one area saying that whether or not that's actually uh, yeah, accurate. Yeah, but it, um, it, it, it's still something that should never be considered. If, no. they're, if they're uniformed combatants, mm. um, you shouldn't be murdering them. There does seem to be a strategy that the Ukrainians are hoping to up the level of Russian atrocities to the point that the Europeans and the Americans feel they, they, they have to um, uh, you know, intervene. And, and that, that's pretty much the only... Well, not the only... It's the only one I can think of, and it seems to be one they're following, um, a strategy that might give them some sort of hope of coming out of this with their country intact. I still don't think um, executing prisoners of war is a good way to go, and Ukrainian soldiers are going to suffer for it as well, mm. um, and Ukrainian civilians. Um, it, it's it's increasing the, 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 the suffering all up. And the other one is the way they have um, announced the conscription without actually doing it of every man aged under 60 in Ukraine. Mm. 
um, which means that particularly refugee families at the Polish border are being split up. Um, and that's an incredibly vulnerable time as, um, you know, women with their children are entering. You know, I mean, this is without trying to say anything bad about Poles, but when you are a refugee in a country that isn't your own, you are incredibly vulnerable to all sorts of people and splitting families up makes them more vulnerable. Mm. Uh, and similarly, I don't think it's particularly useful to be taking um, a whole bunch of civilians um, and trying to give them basic training um, and making them useful soldiers at this point in the conflict. If they were going to mobilise their population, they should have been doing that last November. Um so, you know, that's um, Ukraine. You should rethink some of those those things. Um, but it's certainly the weird thing that everyone who's commenting on this, who knows what they're doing, is saying is, where is the First Guards tank army? Mm. Where are the T-14 Armatas? Where are the, even the, um, the T-90Ss? Um, the, the modern Russian gear is hardly been seen. No. And um, somehow they've managed to crowd the roads um, with... Um, trucks. With soft-skin trucks. Soft-skin trucks and con- conscripts who don't know what they're doing and don't yeah, particularly want to be there. We, we, we thought we were on a training exercise and that we'd been told to come this way. Yeah. yeah it's Yeah, who knows? Uh, look, it's appalling situation for everybody. Um, uh, it is interesting from uh, viewing the tank store to stuff of the damage the, the javelins uh, are doing to the... Uh, T-72s that have been rolled through, so... Yeah. And, and, and the, the British and, in-laws. And the British <laughs> in-laws, yeah, I was going to say. But one of the things with the utter incompetence of this Russian invasion is that they've made contact with the North... Sorry. <coughs> they've made contact with the northeastern side of Kiev, but they haven't begun a proper encirclement or even attempted it. No, and so the... And the Ukrainians are getting supplies from the West, military supplies... By train, yep. because the Russians haven't managed to cut the um, the sodding train line. No. Um, it's um, just nutty levels of... At first, I was like, is this some sort of four-dimensional chess the Russians are playing? But I think we're at the point now where we just have to say it's incompetence. I think so. And look, the only way... Uh, my my uh, back of the uh, envelope uh, speculation is the only way Vlad's going to come out of this uh, with his head held high is that he'll say, all right, I'm going to pull out of uh, Ukraine, but you know what, I'm going to take Belarus on the on the way out. So, Well, except Lukashenko has been a very good ally. I One of the reasons I thought the Nipo River would be more important was because I underestimated Belarus's bastardry in letting the Russians invade mm-hmm. through their territory. Um, but I think Lukashenko, the dictator of um, Belarus, wants to be able to point to his people and say, if you want some of this democracy and these colour revolutions, do you want to end up like Ukraine? Mm. Uh, so the worse things get in Ukraine, the better it is for Lukashenko saying, I am the only way you can be safe. Mm. Could be. Um, and that's the sort of calculus that, you know, is why you get to be a dictator for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of room for sentiment in that um, lifestyle. No. Um, okay. I think we've talked about most of what we've got. And look, we hope the, the situation resolves in the Ukrainian favour um, and that... Or at least resolves in a way that um, ends the killing as quickly as possible. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I do not want to see a guerrilla war in Ukraine with um, the Americans and the British flooding weapons um, no. into civilian populations so only to have the Russians commit atrocities. That's a terrible outcome in, in my view. Uh, I admit that there are not a lot of good outcomes on the table no. at this point. Um, it, you know, if, if six months ago you could have said, okay, how about Ukraine, you acknowledge the breakaway portions of your country want to be Russians, mm. um, and, um, you know, agree that you want the, the sanctions taken off Putin. I, I think that would have been a good deal then. And I think it would have been a good deal even three weeks ago, but now that the shooting started, that sort of deal is probably not on the table. No. Um, I think the Ukrainian people, um, even the ones who were leaning pro-Russian are, are quite largely um, anti-being invaded. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's that's the nature of these things. Civilian populations do um, fall behind their, their, their countries when they're under attack. Mm. <sighs> and on that happy note... Oh, I just want to quickly... Sorry. Um, if you want to... Some really good sources for following. Uh, Michael Kaufman. That's uh, K-O-F-M-A-N. Um is a um, American um, think tanker who um, has been really spot on with his predictions, and he's on Twitter. Uh, and the Australian retired Major General Mick Ryan, 
uh, has been doing some really good stuff on Twitter as well that I would recommend for anyone wanting to follow what's going on. And a special shout out, um, we rarely give them uh, much praise, but the CIA under William Burns, who is a Biden appointee who actually knows Russia, has for once been providing really good information so people aren't surprised, um, which um, credit where it's due. Yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, and on that note, uh, we're going to um, head off. Thanks so much for listening. Um, we will be back next month. Yes. And um, this now for a special episode coming soon. Oh, you're giving the game away. All right, maybe a special episode.